two and a half thousand employees working in there. In the early 20s, Frank Horby, who was already one of the most successful toy manufacturers in the world, decided that he would expand from his core activity making Meccano and move into the toy market. So he came up with the idea of trains so that a father, his son, and maybe a few friends could get around in the evening, construct an entire layout, run the trains, and just have a really good time. What Frank did was to construct an entire outfit. Everything that he needed, needed to be made here on Merseyside. Everything from the track, to the rolling stock, to the animals in the cages, to the signals, even the trackside buildings. We think that this particular train station was modelled on one that stood only a few yards in front of his home, um, which he would have seen on a daily basis. An interesting fact about the actual railways themselves, the first ones ran on 240 volts. And of course, if what, there was a young lad who was playing with his father and the train came off the tracks, you would naturally reach across. And of course, you were reaching across 240 volts, so they rapidly changed it to six volts. They developed some small scale model cars, which were called miniatures. One day, one of the sons, who then worked for Frank, um, had one of these modelled miniatures in his hand. And his wife came in. Uh, he said, what do you think of that, darling? And she said, that's Dinky. And that's how Dinky Toys got the name. So we had Meccano, he had Hornby Trains, he had Hornby Double O, um, Dinky Builder, there was uh, Dolly Vard and uh, Doll's House Furniture, and it, it just goes on and on and on. In his day, Frank Hornby uh, was as big as Dyson, as big as Alan Sugar, uh, he was of the same sort of strength of Branson and such like, he would have employed that many people. The business was absolutely massive. And to think that even though Many of these are up to 100 years old. As you can see, they're still running, running smoothly, and still a sheer joy to watch and listen to. My tenuous link to this is my father was the coal man who delivered the fuel that fired the furnaces that melted the metal that made the toys. So, um, so that's my link and I'm very, very proud of that. <laughs> but yes, I do have a train set. <laughs> When my brother said, come and work in the drum shop, I literally thought they were drums. I had no idea, <laughs> but I was keen. My first week's wages at the BI was n nearly 12 pounds, which is fantastic, <laughs> yeah. So, giving half of that to my mum, I had six quid more or less to, to spend in the week, and it was brilliant. My brother worked there already, and my dad worked in the iron foundry, he was a furnace man. It, it really seemed old fashioned. We used to come out of the BI after the hooter, you'd hear the hooter go. And I can just recall little old men, more or less bent double, leaning forward at haversacks um, and gabardine mats and caps, all sort of marching out together, all bent, like Ellis Lowry pictures. It really was Dickensian in, in some parts. I can remember 
you could look over a, a, a chest high doorway into a, a room and it was the floor was lined with big steel sheets and they had guys with tongs grabbing hot rods of copper I assume and they were put fed them through spinning rollers they were all gradually narrower and narrower and as they fed it through it pulled and a chap on the other side grabbed it with the tongs as it came through and then he'd pass it through the next one which was marginally narrower because this red hot ribbon of copper was getting longer and faster and it just snake snake through and they'd just jump over it and grab hold of the end of it and feed it back through the next and it, it'd be like 30 40 yards long red still glowing red bouncing off the floor just unbelievable constantly smoking sawdust everywhere of <laughs> timber um, it was bizarre bizarre everything was a, a danger even once you'd cut the thing into a circle you had to get it from one point to another you would just roll it you would be rolling something weighing 200 weight 300 weight two inches wide or seven eight foot high in between people to get to where you were going and then you would just let it fall onto a bench while they drilled holes in it um, pick it back up take it to the next process never a dull moment playing football at dinner time in the timber yard in and out of the stacks of timber no one got away uninjured it wasn't just industrial injuries not mainly football related <laughs> Given the work I was doing, it was very repetitive and using a hammer. I mean, my right forearm is a different shape to my left through hammering constantly. I don't know if you can see that. And that's just purely through using a hammer all day. And that's 30 years, 30 years ago and it's still the same. But uh, industrial injury, I never claimed for it. <laughs> Some of the strongest men I've ever known I worked with, unbelievably strong. And a lot of that was uh, down to the, the amount of food we ate in there. And every morning, you used to have uh, a can lad, and he'd take your order for your breakfast. And a lot of the bigger blokes, it was a bit of a competition to see just what you could fit on <laughs> between two rounds of bread. And they'd have cheese, sausage, egg, bacon, beans a Mars bar and it just got out of hand and you know, these, they must have spent the wages on a week's breakfast. My dad was a furnace man but uh, he would go inside the machine with a pneumatic drill and drill off the slag that had built up on the inside of the uh, furnace. No hearing protection to speak of. I mean they had it but it was neither use nor ornament given what he was doing. He used to come home, shirt all bent and all burns across his stomach and where the hot metal had burned through his clothes and gather at his belt and he'd have to shake it out and it, but he'd have all dots of white skin all around him. I've got photographs of my dad with the guys that he worked with and faces black with sweat and muck all sat round having a cup of tea all smiling, <laughs> never changed. I remember he used to run up and take his butties if, he, if he'd forgotten his lunch. We used to stand by the gate and he'd come and we'd pass him his uh, butties through the gate. Sometimes we didn't have the bread. We had to wait till the bread man came to make, to make my dad butties to take up. So it was a big family orientated affair. Every aspect of your life was uh, encapsulated in, in the BI. You could work there and go of an evening and relax in the club or on the football pitches. So it, it was a major uh, impact on people's lives in Prescott. Every Friday night the big bands came up to the leisure centre and we had long dresses and dances. And <laughs> I worked at the BICC um, from when I was 19 to 23. I worked in the typing pool, and in my case, I typed the accounts department. 
this is the, the magazine from the BICC and if you look in the at all the contracts it's worldwide you know so it's not just England and that that's actually my daughter who worked in the wages department my sister was the receptionist there and over the telephone exchange um, my brother-in-law worked in the insurance department and um, father worked in the in the factory I'm not not sure what he did he was manual he just manual labor everybody in Prescott worked there practically you wanted your relatives to work at the BI you'd ask the foreman can I get my ladder job here it was the main employer in the area and they were good the ICC cables were used in transatlantic communications. That's pretty big. So they were proud of it. I just remember it as being a great deal of fun. Um, we made drums along the way as well. My name's Cohen Armstrong and I worked for Lucas Aerospace. I joined Lucas Aerospace in 1993. Did a four year apprenticeship and after that, I got taken on and worked there for 31 years. My dad worked there and my brother worked there as well. My dad was an engineer 40, 50 years. My two brothers are engineers. I mean, it was a job for life when I started there. And when we left, if you're in an engineering place, it's a sign of respect and they give you a bang out. It's a sign of respect, and when the whole factory stops and just bangs you out on the machines, spanners, bang, bang, you've got to, you've got to do a walk down the centre of the factory. And it was emotional, very, very emotional. I remember waking up on the Monday morning, and I woke up, and I, what they were doing now. I mean, I've never been redundant, ever. As soon as I left school, I got a job there. I've been there 31 years. What do we do now? I mean, I'm Sylvia Walker, but my maiden name was Taylor. And it wasn't until my father died in 1988, uh, and I was going through his papers, that I worked out that he was actually born in Prescott. And not only that, that all his family had been here, going back to 1745. <laughs> This little tatty notebook <laughs> is the first thing I saw when I was going through my dad's papers. At first, I thought it was his notebook, but when I looked at some of the dates, I realised it was his grandfather's. 1864. Explosion at Liverpool of gunpowder, about 11 and a half tonnes on board the Lottie Sleigh on Friday night. Uh, about 20 minutes past seven. He was very exact. <laughs> uh, it was commanded by Captain Webber and it was bound for the west coast of Africa. Uh, it shook houses in Prescott and broke windows uh, across the area. <laughs> January the 15th, 1864. There's other things like cricket matches locally. <laughs> There's a lot about the weather. Um, I mean, here's one about um, no fortnight furs held in Prescott, Lancashire, on account of the cattle plague called Rinderpest. That's 1866. Which is funny, isn't it? Because look how tatty it is. It could have just been slung. And because I'm a bit of a hoarder, like my dad and my granddad were, we've still got this little notebook and can shed a light on local history. 
My great-grandfather, he worked in the watchmaking industry and particularly as a file maker. Apparently, uh, he presented his um, files at the Grace Exhibition in London and he won a gold medal. They were used for the watchmaking, but they were also used for um, dentist tools. Any fine metalwork, you had to use files. They were known as Lancashire files, and it was the, they were the best in the country. My grandfather, Joseph Critchley Taylor, he was apprenticed as a printer. This document is an indenture and it was drawn up for any apprentice. So in this case, it, it's related to my grandfather, Joseph Critchley Taylor. It describes conditions, what he must do. And basically, the uh, apprentice uh, at this time, 1891, was bound to his master. And this is where it lists his name, Joseph Critchley Taylor. He was operating from Short Street, which I believe became Chapel Street, and he ended up running the Prescott Weekly Times. So I'm very proud of that. Well, this photograph was in a Victorian photograph album, and this is my grandfather on the left, Joseph Gritchley Taylor, and this over here is his younger brother and two young apprentices. And what they're holding is um, a typeset, a tray, and it is for the Prescott Weekly Times. And I think this would have been taken either in Chapel Street or in Eccleston Street. This is the shop that he had in um, Chapel Street and um, I've got a copy of this where my dad put an X in the top window and he said that that's where I was born in 1913. So uh, the family lived in these premises and in this area for a long time. Although we seem to have this successful business, when war broke out, First World War, um, the Ministry of Munitions decided to uh, take over the printing business um, all the equipment and uh, and it was auctioned and so he was uh, without a job, he had a young family. My father never talked about his family, I think, you know, that generation didn't. So I didn't know anything until after he'd gone and I found all these papers and started looking through them and putting pieces together. And so now I wish I could talk to him about it, but. It's always too late, so I'd say to anyone, talk to your family while they're here. You know, you know, it's, they've had interesting lives. <laughs> I was an apprentice compositor, Tim Lings, from 1970, so when it closed in 75. Um, at that time, it was probably one of the biggest printers you know, on Merseyside. I come here as a 17 year old, 17 and a half year old. It was great training, uh, but it was also, I look back at it with favourably, you know, really good times. So this is where I used to get off the bus. It was the 510 or the 10, and then into work. I think that this part of it is certainly well over 100 years old. There was a big, big band department. There was lithol printers, there was letterpress printers, there was compositors, so it was the whole works under one roof, really. This used to be the main entrance. There was a couple of offices to the left, um, and then there was a narrow corridor in front where you had to clock in. So it's usually a mad scramble with a minute to go for everyone to clock in. I remember distinctly what I think got me the job, was the, the acid to spell words and one of the words was Q, um, which I didn't know I knew how to spell, but I sort of figured it out as I was going along, and she seemed to be really impressed with that. And from that moment, like, um, 
I felt confident to get in the apprenticeship, which I did. So you used to go down a narrow corridor here. On your left was what they called the uh, linotype machines. On the right was the, um, the new computers. And as you went into, this opened up into a big, a big room where all the compositors were. So this is where all the magazines, books, and uh, catalog were prepared. So within there, you'd have the, your magazine section, the old catalog section, and your boot section. So this would have been the corridor leading onto the main room, which housed all the compositors uh, who used to produce all the magazines, the catalogues, and the books. What a compositor did was mainly work with individual pieces of type, put them into words, make them into lines, and build up the pages that way. Also, obviously, every magazine.